Hello, my name is Katie Kalaitis, and I'm the resident scholar at the National Hellenic Museum. And you're about to watch my interview with Robert Kennigal about his new book, Hearing Homer's Song, The Brief Life and Big Idea of Milman Perry, a biography of the man who has been called the Darwin of Homeric studies. Robert Kennigal is the author of nine books and has received many awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Grady Stack Award for Science Writing, and an NEH Public Scholars Grant. His book, The Man Who Knew Infinity, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. I think you'll really enjoy this conversation about a man who's incredibly important in the life of classical studies, Homeric studies, the study of Indo-European languages, and more. And welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I've been looking forward to this for um, a couple of weeks now. So um, thank you so much for taking time to, to come and join us. Thank you, Katie, for, for having me. And thank you, Cairo, uh, for, putting, for putting this on. And um, I'm looking forward to talking, talking to people about Milman Parry and about Homer. Excellent. Um, so my understanding is you do have a presentation for us today. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to go ahead and let you do that. And then I have some questions um, for you afterward because I am a naturally curious person. Mm, good. Okay. <laughs> I'll look forward to them even now. Okay. There we go. Um, and I also wanted to thank the National Hellenic Museum for sponsoring, sponsoring this as well. Um, the name Milman Parry is maybe one you've never heard of, but there he is in the subtitle of my book, um, The Brief Life and Big Idea of Milman Parry. It's his biography. Mine is a book about his brief life, his peculiar driven personality, his travels and adventures in faraway places, his troubled marriage as well, and above all, his big idea. That idea is about Homer. It's Homer who brings us together today. Homer is why we're here. So let's hold off a little on our friend Milman Parry, the man with whom I've spent so much of the last few years and turn to Homer. I don't think this audience needs much reminding that Homer is the veritable first cause of the Western literary tradition, the author of the Iliad and the Odyssey, the two great epics of gods and goddesses, heroes in war. Epic, the word epic because they were long, 25,000 lines of ancient Greek verse making up the two of them. Epic because they told of honor, high ambition, bravery, and the yearning for home, all on huge poetic canvases. The Iliad is centered on Achilles, who angered by what he deems an injustice done him, refuses to lend his warrior skills to the siege of Troy. The Odyssey is about Odysseus and his adventures during a 10 year return from Troy back to Ithaca and his wife, Penelope. Both poems have large casts of characters, many of which, many of whom are getting killed at various points, long speeches, blood, gore, nobly, nobly expressed feelings, and memorable scenes. Odysseus tied to the mast of his ship in order to resist the seductive call of the sirens, or of Achilles dragging the dead body of Hector around the walls of Troy. These are the kind of scenes that have worked their way into the West's collective memory. Once the Homeric epics were the one sure element of a reputable university education. But even those with thin memories of Homer might dimly recall Greek ships hauled up onto the beach opposite the heights of Troy, or Odysseus slaughtering Penelope's suitors, those slack, selfish men who defiled his palace in Ithaca. There's so much to both these Homeric epics. Still, there's no law that says you have to like Homer. Not every ear over the past three millenniums has been receptive to Homer, whether in Greek or in modern translations. 
Even with a devoted teacher, many a high school student stuck with Odysseus and Calypso's island or witnessing another bronze spear splatter another poor brain on the plains of Troy has had his fill of Homer and no wish for more. Homer doesn't take with everyone. But one day in the summer of 1923, Homer did take with Milman Parry. Parry is not known to most of us, I hope, uh, that with my book, he'll be known to many more. But for now, it might be time for a really quick cursory run through of his life. Just some of the raw facts, two minutes, no more. Just to get us all on the same page, he was born in 1902. He died in 1935 at the age of 33. He grew up in Oakland, California, the son of a not entirely successful druggist. He was one of five children. His mother died when he was in his teens. He went to the local high school, Oakland Tech, where he did well. He studied Latin, fair bit of mathematics too. He was a Boy Scout, a chess player. He played tennis. Uh, he played basketball. He was active and intelligent. He won school prizes. Then he went to the university that we today invariably call Berkeley. But back then there was only one University of California campus and it was called simply Cal by everybody. At Cal, he enrolled in a pre-war, pre-law major, but after his first Greek course, he kept on coming back for more, more Greek. Greek, wrote his sister Addison later, became his deep and abiding love. I think it was the sheer beauty and grandeur of spoken Greek and the great delight the Greeks found in simply being alive that attracted him in the first place. In the spring of 1922, Parry, still a student, met a fellow student, Marion. They became lovers. She got pregnant. In May of the following year, they married. Their child, also named Marion, was born in January 1924. She became, by the way, an accomplished artist and book illustrator. She died a few weeks ago at the age of 97. Parry graduated from Cal in 1923. The following year, he earned a master's degree at Cal based on a short thesis devoted to Homer. We'll get, we'll get into that more later. Then later, uh, Parry, his wife and his daughter got in a ship and moved to France uh, to a suburb of Paris. He enrolled at the Sorbonne where he worked with a whole raft of French scholars on a doctoral thesis that represented a vast expansion of his master's thesis at Cal. He defended his thesis, he got his doctorate. His, around the same time, his wife gave birth to their second child, um, Adam. Back in America, pa Parry taught for a year at a small Midwestern college, but that didn't last long because he got the call from Harvard. You don't say no to Harvard, I'm told. Um, in 1933, and then for a longer period in 34, 35, he did very important field research in the former Yugoslavia. Four months after his return to the States, he was dead of a gunshot wound, suffered in a Los Angeles hotel room. So I hope I kept that down to the two minutes I promised, but I think that may ground us a little bit on the story of Parry. What seems to be the really transformative moments in his young life came in the spring, summer, and fall of 1923. It seems that in the spring, he decided to become a writer. He'd helped write his graduating class's senior extravaganza. This was a Cal theatrical tradition. He had contributed a few essays to the university's literary magazine. He was much taken with a well-known Irish essayist of the time. So he was all set. He knew what he was doing, he thought. He approached one of his Greek professors, Ivan Linforth, and declared he's finished with classical studies. Spending much time in the company of Aeschylus, Professor Linforth was given to understand, would corrupt young Milman's natural talent and style. Now, to Linforth, all this sounded like a fait accompli. This was what the boy had decided. From what he'd seen of him in class, Parry was quite a good student, but not somebody so extraordinary that he, Linforth, should try to argue him out of it. He wouldn't try, and he didn't. But the next time the two of them met was in the fall 
by now, Linforth would recall, Milman no longer talked of a writer's life. He seemed to have forgotten the idea entirely. Homer. I'm not quite at that point where all I can talk about is Homer, but it is true that over the past dozen or so years, I've gotten caught up in him myself. I'm not a classical scholar, but a writer by trade. One of my books, The Man Who Knew Infinity, about an Indian mathem mathematical genius, has been translated into modern Greek. I can't read it. For hearing Homer's songs, song, I took a few lessons in ancient Greek from a graduate student in classics at Johns Hopkins, just to get some flavor for the language. In my books, I write for ordinary, educated readers. I like to tell human stories with a little intellectual meat on them. But the stories for me are as important to me as the subjects to which a real scholar might devote his whole life. As for Milman Parry, I came to him through a kind of back door. I've always been a servant, or maybe I should say a slave to my enthusiasms. And in 2007, one of my enthusiasms was a tiny island off the far west coast of Ireland, known as the Great Blasket, inhabited by a few fishermen, all of whom spoke Irish which is to say Irish Gaelic. All through the first half of the 20th century, this island attracted scholars and writers and linguists from all over Europe drawn to this island that had held out against the English and maintained its simple charms. <clears throat> Excuse me, one of these visitors was an Englishman, George Thompson, who first arrived on the Blasket in 1923 and took a lively interest in it and its people for the rest of his life. But back in England, this Thompson fellow was no scholar of things Irish. He was actually a classicist for most of his life, professor of Greek at the University of Birmingham, a student of Greek lyric poetry, Aeschylus and Homer. For reasons I've never quite figured out, I found him a warming and inspiring figure. I found myself intrigued by whatever intrigued him. It was Thompson who dragged me into the classics. Sooner I was launched on the Odyssey and the Iliad through the great Robert Fagel's translations. These were my first forays into Homer since junior high school. In the end, I was caught up in Thompson's ideas about the Homeric question, that Kyle endlessly fascinating centuries old debate about who Homer was, when and where he'd lived, and just what he'd actually done. And it was this, the Homeric question, that led me to Milman Parry. Who is Homer? No one knows for sure. Knows for sure, By one scholar's reckoning, seven places in Greece have over the eons claimed Homer as their own. None of them convincingly. Aristotle in the fourth century BCE wrote of Homer. So did the Jewish historian Josephus in the first century CE. Some have wondered about the two, whether the two Homeric ep epics were actually composed by different people. Others noting all sorts of aberrations and linguistic infelicities in them. Imagine the epics as cobbled together, sometimes not very artfully from numerous original sources. This is from the book itself. The identity of Homer, who or what he was, whether one person, two or more, when he lived, how he or others composed the Iliad and the Odyssey, and even what it means to have composed them have for millennia been raised as questions. Answered, refuted, new challenges thrown down, new evidence gathered in rebuttal. Indeed, for literary work so ancient, so cherished, and so widely read, it's remarkable that such scholarly conundrums, collectively referred to as the Homeric question, were still, by 1923, big, broad areas of debate. Even with the coming of Milman Parry, they have not been and may never be entirely resolved. Even so, the deference accorded his name helps establish Homer as real, as the epitome of genius, almost as if he were a god himself. That one supremely gifted poet wrote two great epics, was for centuries taken for granted by most classical scholars. In antiquity, writes Steve Stanford University's Richard Martin, not even the most hardened cynic doubted that Homer, the master poet, once existed. And in the centuries since, the ordinary reader wouldn't have given 
such questions much thought. Odysseus is escape from the Cyclops. That would command her, the reader's interest. Or the making of Achilles' shield in the Iliad. Or Priam's heart-rending em embassy to Achilles, seeking his son's mutilated body. In Parry's time, too, most readers would have assumed that whatever the implements of writing available to them, Homer, whoever he was, and whenever he lived, at some point sat down to write the two poems attributed to him. After all, he was the author. It says so right on the dust jacket. Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. Shakespeare wrote Macbeth. Plato wrote The Republic. And Homer wrote The Odyssey and the Iliad. Not quite, said Milman Parry. It wasn't so simple. Things weren't as they might seem. The idea apparently came to him in, relatively speaking, a flash during the period between those two meetings with Linforth, the Greek professor that I mentioned earlier. Parry tried out an early fragmentary version of the idea on Linforth, wondered out loud whether he might devote his master's thesis to it, and Lin Linforth said, go ahead. And so, beginning with this master's thesis at Cal, and then later, developing his ideas at vast length and great detail at the Sorbonne in Paris, and then further at Harvard, Milman Parry showed that he, Homer, couldn't have written the Homeric epics because in their earliest form, they weren't written at all. Some other quite different creative process was at work. They had become what they were through some shadowy, traditional, and apparently collective process, not by individual talent and artistry alone. They were the work of generations of illiterate oral poets who composed in real time, on the fly. As they composed, as they sang, they couldn't stop in the middle of things to consider. They couldn't erase. They couldn't cross out lines and start over again. They were doing something entirely different from what writers in any age did, because they weren't writers, they were singers. And whatever they did in front of their listeners, their audiences, they just had to keep going. Did you find my silence just now as exquisitely uncomfortable as I did? As I speak to you today, I have notes in front of me to ward off the stark terror I would feel if I didn't. The ancient oral poets had no notes. They were illiterate. They very likely lived before the appearance of an alphabet. As they spoke or sang their stories, they couldn't pause, didn't pause, had to keep the story and the song and story moving. And it's from them that our Iliad and our Odyssey come from. This was Parry's big idea. The earliest, most significant clue that led Parry to this new idea were the repetitions that mark the text as they come down to us. Come down to us. In both, themes repeated, speeches repeated, gods, heroes, and objects were identified with repeated epithets, as they were called, like swift-footed Achilles, or wily Odysseus, or wine-dark sea, or cunning goddess Calypso, or earthshaker Poseidon, and dozens of others. I should note here that the word epithet that we're using here has in recent years been sullied by the phrase racial epithet, but here the word carries none of that more recent taint. Think rather of Richard the Lionhearted or Babe Ruth, Sultan of Swat. The way Parry made the case, name and epithet were virtually one, all but fused. Epithets for Athena, like gray-eyed Athena, didn't describe her at one particular moment, but in essence, for all time. Often they didn't contribute to the story, sometimes even conflicted with it, as when swift ships, another frequent epithet, sat beached, motionless along the shore. No, the famous epithets noted by anyone who's ever read one of the epics had some other purpose or use. Well, to a receptive ear, they made for a kind of music, adding to the poem's mesmerizing impact. But Parry saw more deeply into them. He discovered distinct patterns in how and when they were used. They would appear on this line or that in a particular position in the line. They helped fill out the poetic line. They made it sound right. The Homeric epics, though they have been translated into prose as well, were poetry. Poetry. 
pure and simple. Dum diddy, dum diddy, dum diddy. Such or something like it is the normal rhythm of the Iliad and the Odyssey as they clip across the epic line and down the epic page. This metrical scheme known as dactylic hexameter is the mainstay of Greek epic poetry, almost defines it. It's a rhythm that's been closely become closely associated with gods and goddesses, heroic actors in heroic times, their stories nobly told. It constrains the syllables that can satisfy it. And the epithets help the poet satisfy the poem's rhythmic demands. That's why they were there in the first place. Yes, they, be, they could be heard as lovely, beautiful, charming, and hypnotic in their own right. But for the oral poet in the throes of poetic creation, telling his larger story, composing as it were on the fly, the handy space-filling epithets help make it possible. For audiences in earlier times, Parry showed, the epithets were all but permanently attached to the nouns they, they graced. Rosy Finger Dawn, God Like Apollo, they appeared with them not when the story decreed, but when they were needed to make the poetic line sound like poetry and not an unmelodic heap of words, used as needed to move the great poem along. To reiterate, the oral poets that Parry had come to see as the originator of the epics were not people who simply recited their poems or other people's poems. They were people who composed them in real time right in front of you, carrying on, never stopping. Moreover, Parry and Albert Bates Lord, who after Parry's death carried on his work, concluded that the oral poets did not actually memorize. They heard other poets sing similar stories. They absorbed something from them. They embellished, they invented new details, but there was no one original version from which other versions could be said to diverge. There was no real beginning to this complex process, nor was there any end. There was no final best version. Until that is, perhaps hundreds of years later when they were set down on paper and became the books we see today. <clears throat> As to just what role a person named Homer may have played years, centuries, and generations later, Parry never really addressed, and we don't know today. As Parry developed it at the Sorbonne and in paper after paper over a span of about 10 years, this was a great elaborately developed idea, one he pursued relentlessly, immersed in the ancient texts, exploring the lines, seeking in them patterns, counting various elements of these songs, seeing in them evidence of oral poets at work. But in time he realized, I think he felt a little embarrassed actually, he wouldn't have recognized an oral poet if he had run into one on the street. He had never heard one sing. It was all in the books at this point. So let me take you back to the year 1931. Parry is at Harvard, more or less comfortably situated there in Cambridge, Massachusetts with his wife and two children. It's April and he's writing his sister Addison back in California. He writes to the children of the early talkie he's seen with his wife, it was a Marlena Dietrich film actually, of how he'd had a tooth pulled, but would spare his sister the gruesome tale of what happened. It was another of the light, ultimately unrevealing letters Milman Parry often wrote home. But he did have one hard kernel of real news. I'm just now studying Serbian so that I can read Serbian epic poetry. Then in two years or so, he, he said he'd apply for a fellowship and spend a year in Yugoslavia to find the explanation of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Now, it might seem Parry by this time had furnished plenty of explanation. What more did he expect of himself? Actually, I think, as I've said, I think Parry was embarrassed in his own eyes. He had never once heard or met the sort of oral poet he claimed was responsible for the Odyssey. Now his plan was he would. Sure enough, by 1933, Parry was in the former Yugoslavia with his family, if only briefly that first year. The second trip extended over a year and a half into 1935. Parry went from town to town, village to village, finding these oral poets, most of them illiterate, who embodied Serbian, Bosnian, Croatian, and Montenegrin traditions of epic poetry. They were known as gooselars, for the one-stringed instrument, the goosler, 
that they played as they saw as they sang. To me, untutored in this, it was an awful sounding thing, actually. <clears throat> Parry tracked them down across Yugoslavia and recorded them in early sound recording equipment. Parry's daughter, Marion, who was 10 years old at the time of the second trip, would later offer a kind of child's eye view of her father's trips from Dubrovnik, where the family stayed, into the Yugoslavian backcountry. She wrote this. My father explained that Yugoslavia was an uncivilized country at the edge of the world on the border of the Slavic wilderness, which stretched from the Adriatic to Alaska. Since hardly anyone could read or write, Yugoslavians still had retained their oral poetry and their ancient native national civilization. There were still heroes and heroic acts, and the ancient heroes were celebrated in ballads by gooselars or bards who knew by heart, who knew by heart so much poetry that if it were written down, it would fill libraries. But the whole thing depended, my father explained, on the fact that they couldn't write it down as soon as literacy becomes common in a country. Everyone gets lazy. They don't bother to learn things by heart anymore. And poetry is no longer a, a part of their daily life. So again, this is the adult Marion looking back to how she experienced what she heard from her father some years before. Parry returned to the States in the fall of 1935 with all these recordings. Bailey studied them at the time, but then after his death, much more intensely they were studied by the student who'd accompanied him uh, on the second trip, Albert Bates Lord. <clears throat> these hundreds of songs, along with interviews with the singers, showed much the sort of creative process Parry had imputed to the ancient pre-Homeric singers to whom he attributed the Odyssey and the Iliad. In particular, there was one singer named Avdo Medetovic. His long songs of Balkan life, some almost as long as the Odyssey or the Iliad, rich in story, detail, and flavor, seem to provide the final proof of Parry's explanations for the roots of the Homeric epics. So what have we got here? A happy ending? It might have been. It could have been. <laughs> But a few months after Parry's return to the States in late summer of 1935, he was dead, age 33, of the gunshot wound in the Los Angeles hotel room. He and his wife were there on their way down to San Diego to see Parry's sister and her family. They'd just come from the San Francisco Bay Area and we got to see what could seem almost like a, a victory lap after the success of the Yugoslav venture. But there in that hotel room, a revolver went off. The bullet grazed Parry's heart. Hotel staff first thought Mrs. Parry had killed him. Police were called. Two veteran LAPD officers on the scene and interviewed Mrs. Parry. No charges were filed. The official ruling? An accident caused, according to Marion, by a revolver wrapped in her husband's suitcase somehow, maybe by being dropped, going off. Now, over the coming years, rumors would abound and linger that Parry had committed suicide. I see no evidence of that whatsoever. On balance, an accident does seem most likely. On balance, but only a little bit less likely is an alternative explanation that Mrs. Parry did kill him. This is, in fact, what Parry's grandchildren grew up hearing from Parry's daughter. And the possible motivation for such an act? Well, look, as for all of us, there's a whole other side to Parry, namely his personal life and his married life with Marion. Men and women do great things out in the world. Maybe they achieve fame. Maybe they're test pilots or ballerinas or entrepreneurs. But we have private lives, too, and these are not always happy and not always open to inspection, especially so for Milman Parry, who is rather an unrevealing man, never quick to share his thoughts and feelings. And so again, the possible motivation, maybe it was one, if it happened that way, of Mrs. Parry's fits of fierce, irrational rage, or maybe cool-headed revenge for real or imagined infidelities, or for being by him a little too much as he worked, or other hurts he'd inflicted on her over the years. Mrs. Parry and her daughter, twisted by a lifetime's mutual antagonism, were both named Marion. <clears throat> 
Marrying the younger was all but certain her mother had killed her father and held to this view all her life. As I tried to work out just what happened in that LA hotel room almost 90 years ago, I became maybe just a little obsessed. I went through all the old news reports. I found documents buried at Harvard. I traced the history of the hotel. I visited the hotel, which is now serving as housing for local street people in downtown LA. I wandered through its halls, trying to imagine what it might have looked like almost a century ago. At one point, I told my friend Joel about my little adventure, about my interest in, jo in Parry's death. What he said was this, why should any of that matter? Who cares how your Mr. Parry died? Who cares if his wife killed him? Isn't the important thing what he did in his life? Well, I don't quite hold to that lofty view. I'm interested in death as well as life, in the frankly dark side of being human being, as well as the sunny, the noble, and the fine, and how people are sometimes led to act in frustration or anger. I suppose I wouldn't be a writer if I didn't feel that way. So it was okay, I think, to be just a little preoccupied with Parry's death as much as I was. But Joel, my friend, was right too that the important thing was what Parry did and what he found and what it means. And if we turn from Parry's death to his life, we can answer this question. Milman Parry broke through, destroyed really, what had for many, for so many and for so long, seemed obvious and incontestable. That one person, this Homer for one, of, a of another name, <clears throat> had sat down to write the Iliad and the Odyssey in the way so familiar to us all. I'll end our talk as I end this book. Parry created a new idea of poetic artistry. This is his memorial. He imagined a new way of looking at old words and how they'd come into the world that profoundly influenced all of classical studies and in time the humanities generally turning to the same facts and the same ancient texts, he saw in new ways what they implied, asked new questions, and fashioned new tools with which to study this varying species of poetic expression, one formed on the breath of word and song long before anyone was there to take it down. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate um, your very interesting um, talk, and I'm sure the people in our audience are going to um, want to read the book. Um, and I would encourage everyone to do that first, because clearly um, you're an insightful um, biographer and writer, and they should read the book. Um, but also, as I may have mentioned to you, I am a Cal alumna. And um, so Milman Perry and, um, and Ivan Linforth um, loomed large in my early, um, early classical education, right? Because if you're a classics major at Cal, these figures are going um, to loom large. So I wanted to start with um, Doris Kearns Goodwin, the, the um, brilliant presidential biographer um, said that she had to pick her subjects based on people she really would like, because you have to spend a lot of time with someone if you're writing their biography. So I guess my first question for you is, um, do you like Milman Perry and was he good company in all the hours you spent together? His work was certainly good company. Whether I would actually like him, I'm not sure that I would. He was very intense. He was um, uh, highly focused. I have heard a lot from Marion's side of what he was like, and um, also from some of his colleagues at Harvard. He was so highly focused, which is perfect, which is exactly what you want in a scholar or a writer, but maybe it's not something you want as a wife or a pal or a friend. I'm not sure. Um, when I first got started on this, I knew he was associated with these ideas. And then I assumed that he had gone off and done different kinds of work in the classics for the rest of his career. That wasn't the case. Basically, he worked on this idea for the entire time from about 1923 to his death in 1934. 
various elements of it, various ways of getting at it, but essentially one idea. And that requires focus, and he brought plenty of focus to it. But again, I'm not sure I would have liked it. <laughs> Okay. Um, you don't you don't really know about somebody. You don't really know about somebody in, until you're in the clinches with him, as I'm sure we've all found. <laughs> yes, especially this this past year. Um, that's a very diplomatic um, diplomatic answer. Um, but you mentioned this kind of um, you know sort of fixation or um, or sort of obsessiveness. I think that's, you know, the chief requirement, I think, to finish a PhD thesis really is a kind of obsessive personality. Um, and I, I, I think that's true of, I think, you know, there's these personalities. Do you think there's something about Homer that attracts that kind of devotion, as it were, the, the, the sort of attention Homer grabs not just from Milman Perry but from people for thousands of years. I think devotion is a good word by the way. It has uh, almost a religious flavor. Uh, it has a religious quality I think and I think anyone whether a writer or a scholar or anyone who takes his work seriously will develop or sh I don't want to say should develop, but let's say often develops this kind of devotion to his or her subject. Whether Homer does so more than others, I don't know. But all I know is that once I got started with those Fagel's, Robert Fagel's translations of the Odyssey and the Iliad, I was sold. I mean, um, I got caught up in the stories I got caught up you know you always wonder what are you losing by reading not in the original language but reading a translation and in many cases I read various other translations of various parts which I found fascinating just to imagine the act of the translator trying to go through the original and then translate it and then it's bears resemblance but is not the same as all the other translations that have come before i find that fascinating but yes i don't have any trouble seeing how homer uh brings out the devotion of those who study him well i'll just say i mean having read homer in, in the original as as well as as many translations the fagel's translation i feel like is um sort of a work a great work of english literature in its own right at, at some level um even in its loyalty um to the homeric to the homeric text so I guess my next question then would be before you became a student of Homer, it sounds like over, over the past little while, were there other sort of Indo-European, those echoes of the Indo-European? So for example, um, were you interested in the, in the um, Gaelic tales or um, Norse mythology? Was there, is there something in your life before that, that brought you to this subject? What brought me to the Great Blasket, the Irish yeah. island that I talked about, and yeah. George Thompson, was that I got married. And we had to decide where we were going to go on a honeymoon. And we decided we wanted to go to Ireland and that we didn't want to go particularly to Dublin. We wanted to see the far west portions. And that brings you into an area that they called the Gale Tech. I shouldn't be trying to pronounce it, but it's something like <laughs> that. <clears throat> but it refers to those areas of Western Ireland where people still speak, um, still speak Gaelic. What was special about the Blasket was that everybody spoke Gaelic and nobody spoke English. That's, that's incredible. And when you think about those pockets of, of linguistic survival, right? Um, this is something that sort of interests me, the way um, these, these linguistic communities can survive and the keys they really give us um, to, these, to, these bigger, to these bigger questions. Um, so so you, you come to Homer, you come to the Homeric question, I guess, in the same way, the, the opposite direction, but to the same point that Milman Perry does, which is sort of, sort of interesting. Um, so I have word that our, our time is running um, somewhat, somewhat short. So I just have a, just one or two more questions sure. um, and then I will liberate you for the rest of your day from um, 
from the from the Greeks. Um, okay, so here's the, here's here's my um, my my penultimate question for you. Um, why write and read the biographies of scholars? Could you develop that a little bit, please? Yeah. So um, I think there it makes sense to me at some level. Um, it, it was, I'm sorry, that's the wrong way to say it. It's obvious why we read, for example, the biographies of great political figures, because they sort of illuminate these moments of, of historical significance. Um, what seems less obvious, and maybe even of cultural figures, right? So of writers and artists, um, that makes sense to me, um, or makes sort of intuitive sense to me. But at some level, someone who sort of is a scholar, as an academic, I don't know about a scholar, but someone who's an academic, um, I see my role, I mean, I see my, my life, the stuff I do is mainly comment on what's going on or comment on what's happened. And it feels much less on the inside, like an active, being an active participant. Mm. So I wonder what do we gain? But when I was reading your book, I was like, yeah, we should read the biographies of scholars more. So what do we gain from reading? I see your question now. Yes. Yeah. Um, what does a writer or a scientist or an entrepreneur do? He or she gets caught up in a writing project or starting a business or solving a scientific problem. And I mean, many of my books have been devoted to figures like this. One was about a mathematician. Um, there is something um, I would say noble, but also riveting as somebody down, you know, working through his problem, facing his challenge. Not every challenge is uh, with other people. Other, other challenges can be with your own material, with what, with what you don't understand and seek to understand. And I think that is, is just as good and just as rewarding as um, any other kind of uh, biography. It has a built-in tension. How did he get there? How did she come to understand that? What obstacles did she face in trying to understand that? And so on. And I think that can make for um, a fabulous story that can in fact also inspire us as readers to confront our own problems in whatever form they exist and to have the tenacity to go back to them. Because most of these problems, whether in science or math or the classics are not obvious. They're not clear cut. They confound you. And there you are in the position of trying to, trying to come to grips with it. And that is its own human story. I think that's a story worth telling. Wonderful. That is a brilliant answer. Um, so we've talked a little bit about your personal experience of, of, of reading Homer. I'd be interested, have you, uh, is there anything you've learned from Homer that's changed how you view your life or the world? Hmm. I think reading Homer resurrects a child. Well, I, I'm a man, but once I was a boy, and a boy, um, I think, tends to think in terms of heroes and what he can achieve and what he can live up to and what he wants to do with his life. And the effect of reading Homer is to be confronted with the heroic ideal uh, on every page. And what what can we what can the hero achieve? Facing this the sternest sternest uh, opponents, problems, challenges, tasks, temptations, the hero uh, is confronted with them. And I think reading the two of them um, had the effect of bringing me back to the boy that I was who saw things. Um, through a sort of heroic eye. That's really a beautiful answer. 
thank you so much for joining us. Um, this has been absolutely wonderful. The book was an absolute pleasure to read. Um, I know that there will be links um, to go ahead and buy that. I highly recommend it. Um, I sat down and read it in, in a night uh, because it was so good. So um, absolutely go read the book. Um, really wonderful. Thank you so much for your time and um, best best of luck as as the book comes out and you um, you you begin um, promoting a book in this very unusual climate. So the mm -hmm. so best of luck it is, it is certainly um, it is certainly a, a worthy cause. Thank you so much for having me and uh, the viewers of this event. Uh, I thank you for for listening. <laughs> thank you so much. And until next time, this is the National Hellenic Museum's online lecture series. <laughs>